Hello, my name is James Conrad, and it's my pleasure to be here with you as we examine the Certified Ethical Hacker series. Now, I did a, a series a while back, a few years ago, that was also a Certified Ethical Hacker series, but it was relating to older exam objectives that the EC Council had put out. Uh, most of that information actually is still good, but we need to really kind of revamp the whole thing for current topics and for the current ex uh, version of the Certified Ethical Hacker exam. One of the things we'll talk about here is just an introduction to hacking. Yes, you're watching an introduction video, and then our next video will also be an introduction. And why am I doing that? Because that's actually one of the exam objectives. In fact, these bullet points that we're going through pretty well map out to the exam objectives that the EC Council has set up on their website. And certainly you can go there and download uh, the specifics of each exam objective on your own. And in fact, you'll need to do that to be properly prepared for the exam. Uh, but one of the things we'll be taking a look at in the introduction is just some basic terminology, information about how to become a hacker and so on. Uh, we'll also take a look at VMware and Linux. Now, this particular bullet is not in the exam objectives directly. There's no module for that. However, I know that many of us are administrators who are in job roles where we don't really necessarily use VMware, maybe we don't really use Linux, uh, and so we don't really have a good hands-on feel for those two items. Well, it's going to be pretty important if you're going to be a hacker to be adept at those two items, and at least basic capabilities with Linux. Uh, then we'll also take a look at footprinting and reconnaissance. Uh, the first few bullets that we'll look at here and on the next whiteboard are very important because you need to make sure that you don't waste time trying to hack things that don't actually exist or that not, are not actually there and that you've correctly identified things that are there. Uh, some of these things are going to be what we call passive reconnaissance where uh, it's really just public searches for information maybe even on the internet. Then also we're going to be scanning networks. Now this is where you have to start being more careful because you don't want to become detected and get kicked off the network or something like that. You have to really uh, keep sly about this and avoid detection. We'll talk about that as we go here as well. Enumeration is also going to be very important in this because you need to identify, well, once you've done scanning your networks and, th and things like this, you need to identify specific users, specific groups, uh, maybe identify the kind of hardware that's in use and things of this nature. So that's where we add all that up. We'll take a look at system hacking as well. This is where a lot of the fun really begins in terms of actually doing hacks. Uh, you need to know how to crack passwords, for example. In almost any organization, there's usually going to be some passwords that you can crack. And it doesn't even matter if it's not an administrator's password, because you might be able to still log on and escalate privileges in a couple of different ways. There's also Trojans and backdoors. These are kind of uh, things that really come into the network unnoticed by the user because they might just be downloading a game and maybe it actually works. The game is fine and everyone uh, everyone seems to be enjoying it, but somebody may have uh, wrapped a Trojan inside of that inside of that game. And you can even do this with common Windows utilities like I don't know, Notepad or Calculator or something like that. You could replace the Windows versions of those applications with one that has a Trojan or a backdoor in it that allows a hacker to get into your network and usually take full control of it. Also, viruses very often will have a similar function to that. Now, sometimes we kind of synonymize Trojans and viruses. They're, they have a lot of similar functions. Sometimes, however, a virus might just be malicious, or it might be something that will do something like install a keylogger so that people can see everything that you're typing and get your passwords and things. Worms, of course, will then send themselves out to other folks as well, usually through something like your Outlook mailing list or uh, address book. There's also sniffers. Uh, this is going to be very important. Probably Wireshark is the most common sniffer right now, but there's several different ones out there, Kane and Abel, uh, many others, that are very useful in doing things like getting passwords. One of the things you have to be careful of there is to make sure that you don't get too much information, and you need to learn how to write appropriate filters to get only the information that really matters to you. And then as we continue on, this is something that is really a touchy issue for me. Uh, that's this social engineering item. Basically, what you do with this is most of the time you're just going to be lying or telling half-truths. And your objective with this is to get information out of somebody. Uh, you might fake that you're part of their IT staff when you, when you call them up and try to get a username and a password out of them. It's not always quite that easy, and a lot of users are better educated nowadays, but there's still many ways of getting social engineering to work. I've been able to get into buildings and locations uh, where I really wasn't supposed to be just because I looked like I belonged there. Okay. Uh, there's also a lot of this nowadays is coming out through email and phishing emails as well. That's part of social engineering. Also, denial of service is very important. You may want to uh, put up some fake DNS 
uh, entries somewhere, but the real DNS server on that person's network is still providing service. Well, if you can bring down that DNS server and bring up your own fake DNS server instead, that might be a big part of the denial of service uh, so that you can use your own services. Or it might just be vandalism. You just want to bring it down, you know, because you're mean or something. I don't know. <laughs> There's also session hijacking. Uh, this is pretty fun. This is where you can take over someone's existing session or, or even just view their existing session so that you can exploit it later. We'll take a look at hacking web servers as well. Uh, web servers on their own are designed to be very public and open so that people can see it. I mean, people need to sell a product on their web page or whatever. But at the same time, uh, there's openings there that might be inadvertently left there that you can exploit, as well as web apps, which may not be properly designed or, or set up on the website, and you might be able to exploit some of those as well. And then continuing on, one of the key things that you really got to look out for is SQL injection. This has had a few different vulnerabilities over the years, but if you can properly perform some kind of SQL injection, you can do a lot of different things to a database. You can, well, you might be able to exploit it in terms of getting data out of it or manipulating data. We'll take a look at hacking wireless signals as well. Now, this is really easy when it comes to locations where no one with IT knowledge has adequately protected the environment. Other places, it takes a little longer, especially if they're using good security measures, but wireless on its own is actually just radio signals that anybody can pick up. So that on its own makes it uh, something of less of a physical barrier than you would have with like a conventional Ethernet wired network. We take a look at evading intrusion detection systems, firewalls, honeypots. These are all things that could derail you and prevent a successful penetration test. We take a look at buffer overflows as well, and particularly, you know, the tool that's really used almost exclusively nowadays is going to be Metasploit, and that's because it already has everything you need, and uh, it's got a full database of different ex exploits that you can use within it. Cryptography is important to understand as well, because you need to understand the the difficulty that's involved in some crypto cryptography. It might not be worth your while to directly hack against something. Or if someone's used a weak cryptography, then you might be able to use a tool that can decrypt some of those things quite easily. Also, we'll take a look here at pen testing. Now, that's really what we do as certified ec ethical hackers. Uh, we're really trying to do a penetration test, especially because I want to emphasize we're trying to be ethical here. We're not trying to hack into things that we're not supposed to hack into. We have a likely a contract to be able to get in there. So we're just testing it out to see what a, a black hat hacker would do. We want to try to mirror that as much as possible. And also, uh, pen testing as well as a lot of the other things we'll be looking at here, that's pretty much what we're doing throughout the whole series. We don't get to pen testing only when we get to the last exam objective. Uh, we're taking a look at pen testing throughout the entire thing. It's kind of interwoven, and much of what we'll be taking a look at in all of these bullets uh, from the whiteboards I've shown you so far are really kind of interspersed throughout, so they're not always defined in only a specific topic. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at some other important things to keep in mind as a certified ethical hacker, however. And the things I'm addressing here aren't really part of the exam objectives. They're just from me to you as your CBT Nuggets instructor. And the first part of this is that I'm not really providing any legal advice. I might tell you what I think is legal or what I hope is legal or what I hope we can get away with. Uh, but it's not actual legal advice. And so you're going to need to get your own advice in those terms, whether it's your own corporate attorney if you work for a corporation or whether you get your own advice uh, some other way. Because I'm not an attorney, uh, although I played one on television. <laughs> no, I didn't really. Uh, but you can you get your own advice there. Uh, I'm just going to give you my own opinion. That's the best I can do. Also, keep in mind, it might even be illegal to pen test your own network. If you work for a corporation and, and you start doing penetration tests, it might be in violation of your own corporate policy, or there might be actual laws against what you're doing there. So before you do any pen tests, you must get proper authorization, and don't just get kind of a handshake from your boss, say, hey, I was going to try to do some things, is that all right? Oh, sure, why not? Let's go to lunch. Uh, you need to get that in writing somewhere, even if it's just through an email chain or whatever, and that's just my best advice there, but uh, everything I tell you here really goes back to this one. <laughs> that's not actual legal advice. Uh, but I'm just telling you that it could be illegal. you got to really watch out there. Another reason why that might be illegal is you might have subsidiaries in your corporation. If you start hacking against your company uh, and you have authorization for that, but it may not extend down to the subsidiaries, which you also have network reach 
too. Uh, that you have to be careful for. So just be aware of those things. Also, don't get impatient. Most hacks actually are unsuccessful. Uh, the stuff that I'll be showing you in this video series, most of it looks like, wow, he just came up with this and immediately it works. Uh, some of that stuff takes hours for me to prepare to show you, and there's a lot of trial and error. A lot of these hacking tools don't have very good help. Uh, some of them don't really even have very much resource out there on the internet. So you have to be very, huh, very patient with how some of this stuff works, but once you get it going, it's very gratifying, and I think you'll find that it's worth the patience. Another reason why some of the hacks are unsuccessful if you're actually doing pen tests might be because an organization actually is very well protected. Uh, the best hacker I know, I had a conversation with him this past summer, and I asked him, I said, hey, are there any uh, locations that you've tried to hack that you just actually can't get in? And he said, yes. Uh, there are some very difficult ones. They're usually three-letter acronyms and those sorts of things. Uh, but given enough time, he could. But usually he gets hired to do a penetration test that lasts between one to three weeks, maybe a month. And uh, if you had more time, you could eventually brute force a password or something like that. But given the time we have, you just can't always get in uh, in an actual penetration test. Now, the last thing I want to point out here is, and you, can, you need to check this with the EC Council's website, uh, th this is an expensive exam. I think it's about 500 bucks or so, and there's no retakes. So if you fail it and you really want to get your certified ethical hacker, you have to pay for it again. Wow, that really hurts. Microsoft exams are much less expensive. I think they're 125 bucks, and they even have some retake policies that they offer as special offers every now and then. I think you can retake it for you know half price or something like that. But the Certified Ethical Hacker one is very expensive. So pay careful attention to this video series. And you'll also need to put your hands on some of your own hacking tools so that you have good experience with this. Uh, I just want you to be very well prepared before you take that. Also, you do have to have continuing education credits in order to maintain the Certified Ethical Hacker. So just be aware of that as well. Well, I got to tell you, I'm really looking forward to working through this series with you. I'm very excited as a hacker to be able to show you some some of the things that we can do for, you know, hacking for fun and profit, so to speak. Uh, but again, realize that we are mostly really doing this as certified ethical hackers. But all those disclaimers out of the way, let's get started and get on our way to the next video where we can start taking a look at certified ethical hacking.